This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard to find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. My guest today on Sports Files is Memphis Tigers head basketball coach Josh Pastner. <laughs> Last summer, Josh Pastner added a late component to the Memphis Tigers roster, bringing in former Missouri standout Michael Dixon Jr. to add some depth and firepower. The result was mixed with some standout victories and some devastating losses. The addition of Dixon to an already loaded backcourt created at times chemistry issues. Fast forward to present day, and the Tigers are gearing up for a new season in which expectations will likely be tapered a bit. Many players on the team are limited in game experience or, quite frankly, have none to speak of. So what can a coach do? Well, in Josh's case, go out and get some players who have the experience. Enter Keedron Johnson and Calvin Godfrey. Today, Josh Pastor joins me to talk about the new season, which is right around the corner, and it's next on Sports Files. Josh, great to see you again. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me, Greg. Always, always glad to be able to join you. Never too early to talk Tiger basketball, but this was a little bit unusual as well because you played some games over the summer, exhibition games in Canada. So it was a very busy summer. Absolutely. Not that it isn't always for you with recruiting and all that, but you got to practice with the guys. You got to play four games in Canada. But as you know, this team's going to look a lot different when you open up practice next month. With that said, what did you accomplish in Canada? Well, Greg, the reason we did the foreign trip and the foreign trip, you know, outside of the United States, uh, the NC2A allows you to do every four years. Uh, I felt it was really important for us to do the trip, and most teams want to do it for the practices. Right. I really want to do it for games. Hmm. I felt our team was so inexperienced and so non-game experienced from the previous years because other than Shaq and Austin and Nick King the second half of the season, nobody's really had game experience. And I felt we needed to play good competition. And I checked around, and everyone told me teams up in, in the Ottawa area in Canada uh, had good competition. Carleton, who's a nine or ten time uh, champion over there in the Canadian League and played University of Ottawa and McGill University. But, but especially Carleton and, and Ottawa, it gave us good teams. We were playing older teams and allowed our guys to play good minutes in real game situations, and we were able to evaluate and take that opportunity from the tape to learn from it. Which makes perfect sense to get these young guys to taste of what it's going to be but all about. But it's not just the young guys. Karan Iverson last year, didn't play. he's a sophomore. He barely played. You know what right. I mean? So it's all those guys. It's not Markel Crawford. Mm -hmm. Hadn't played in two years. Pookie Powell didn't play last year. So it's not just the incoming guys. It's right, the guys right. that well, were returning from the team. Exactly. But I'd still consider yeah, them young as far, as far as playing right. time. But now you have to integrate these, these new guys. Yes. And, and as we sit here and tape, Nothing yet official from the NCAA on Keedron Johnson or Calvin Godfrey, but we expect that they will be approved with their waivers. Treshawn Burrell, who we knew was going to be part of the team, yep. finally is officially, Official, yep. but he didn't practice or no. go to Canada. We know Austin did not play in Canada. Correct. So is it going to be starting anew once camp opens There's up? There's going to be some newness for sure. Um, and let me say this. I do believe that if all those guys become eligible, you know, if the NC2A grants the waiver for – uh, we've got Burrell in, but if they grant the waiver for Keedron Johnson and Calvin Godfrey. And you expect it. I, 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 I expect it. I think okay. it's hard for them not to be able to grant it, but you never know. But mm -hmm. uh, I do expect it. Uh, but if they do, uh, you know, that, I think that puts us right back into a top 25 team right, right from the start, you know, right in that area there. If they don't grant those guys waivers, we're not going to be a preseason top 25 team. You know, we're going to have some work to do to be able to get there. We're still waiting on the kid, Demonye Cunningham. I'm still waiting on some things academically. So we still have some, you know, uh, pieces out there that we haven't got finalized yet and you're right Greg assuming everything goes through knock on wood that all goes through um, that 
it is going to be a little bit different. We have new guys, and you're going to have to teach them on some of the things. But, but Kedron Johnson, if he's eligible, he's had major game experience. Calvin Godfrey has had major game experience. Nick King, uh, 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 Karan Iverson, Markel Crawford, Pookie Powell, those guys had not had game experience. Right. That was so important. Avery Woodson came in. He got good games, didn't play well in some games, played well in some others. Dominic McGee got good game experience. And Austin, I wasn't worried about him not playing. Why? Because he had started all last year, got mm-hmm. major game experience. The guys that needed to play played and got good experience out of it. The late additions, and I mean late finding out in Absolutely. August or September that you're going to have these players, is not unprecedented for you because you added Michael Dixon Jr. last year, yep. had to integrate him. So with that said, having done that, I would imagine you're used to it, but I, I would think it's still somewhat of a challenge for you and the coaching staff. It is a challenge, but, you know, I also – that's one of the advantages of, of, of using the time that the NC2A allows you, the two hours a week, to be able to practice during the summer, the summer access rule that we weren't able to do a few years ago. Right. You're able to see some of your strengths and weaknesses you are as a team. And during that time, if there's guys out there, it allows you an opportunity to maybe to get a guy to help you in an area of a, of a weakness. Um, and what we, one of our weaknesses was our really was our experience factor. And we're bringing two guys in if they end up getting through is Kedron Johnson, who's a two-year starter from a well, very well-coached team in Vanderbilt. Calvin Godfrey, who's a you know a starter uh, from from Southern and played at Iowa State originally. And they both have had some you know missteps along their way, you know, stubbed their toe, and and they know that they've got to follow the the, the, the straight and narrow path. Uh, but they bring great experience. And let me also say this, Greg, you know, with all that being said, <clears throat> it's it's something that uh, I think with that, you can't really put a, pr- a premium or a price tag, as I say, uh, when guys who've been through it, like they're not going to go to Connecticut and be phased. They're not going to be going to a, a hostile environment because they've been through it. Been and there, I, done and that. I think that makes a big difference a lot of times when guys haven't been through that area. There are some there are some people that have criticized you for taking guys, taking chances with guys who have had issues in their past, but it's worked out very well. You've done a great job with guys like Jaron Johnson, Michael Dixon Jr. Now you're, you're going with a guy like Kedra Johnson who did not play at all last year for Vanderbilt. Then again, on the flip side, you have uh, freshmen that come in and obviously didn't work out with Dominic Woodson. So it can, let, it can happen either but, way. But let me say this. Um, <clears throat> I, I have no problem giving someone a second chance. Right. And, and I, I've, and, but I have to believe that, one, the, the, the reason they, 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 the previous institution dismissed them was uh, something that these guys understand that they're remorseful for. They understand that this is their second chance. Obviously, that I want to make sure that, that they understand about being here, that being on the straight and narrow, that I, that I am not going to uh, uh, let you go to the right or the left. You're right. going to have to do this or you're out of here. And and I've also been very, as you know, Greg, I've, I've with guys, if guys aren't going to be on the straight and narrow or do things that I want to do, whether you're a second chance guy or not, I believe in discipline with the program. I believe in structure. Uh, and if guys don't have two feet in, you're going to be moved out. And um, I had to do it, you know, we've had to do it in the past. I've done it before. I don't want to have to do it in the future, but if it's called for, I have no problem doing it because nobody is bigger than the program. Let me also say this. Starting August 1st in 2015, no longer are any waivers accepted. If you transfer, let's say a guy like Keevan, Keedron Johnson or, or Calvin or any of these guys, and this is not just Memphis, this is all across the country, there's no more of the waiver process. It's out. The only way someone can play right away for, is if you if it's a graduate transfer. So anything in the future moving forward, you will have to sit a year. Wow, that's interesting. All right, let's go Starting over. Starting August 1, 2015. Okay, so let's go over some of these guys very briefly. Give me some thoughts on Kedron Johnson comes in with experience. Obviously, at the point guard position, very, very young going into this season before Kedron with Pookie Powell, Markel Crawford. This Kedron, and I know you're not going to give away your hand here, but Obviously, he's going to get a shot to, to be the starter, and most people would think with his experience he would be, but I imagine it's wide open once you get to camp. Well, it's, it's going to be wide open, and, he, and I've told him this. He's going to have to earn everything he gets. We're not going to put, give anything to him, and Pookie and Markell are good players. Um, Dominic McGee is a good player, and, and the thing with Kedron is he, he's been a two-year you know, starter pretty much in, in a Vanderbilt team that's very well coached with Coach Stallings and, and uh, playing in the SEC, uh, you know, has been in the hostile environment, so he understands it, but he's going to have to earn it, and he's got to be in great shape. He came in, he wasn't in basketball shape coming in here. Right. He was just flat out, you would have you would have been in better shape than him, Greg. <laughs> I so, don't know about that. So I'm telling you. <laughs> Now, he's worked hard. Our strength right. coach has done a good job with him, and he continues to get himself in shape. But that's going to be a big key for him. 
With the loss of Woodson, you lose some of the depth in the front court, and you're already thin going in. So Godfrey's going to be important. Godfrey's going to be very important for us for that depth in the front court. But, you know, I don't think we're a, a big team as in terms of a wide right, team. Right, right. We are a long team, and we have to use that to our advantage. Like, Karan Iverson's legit 6'9". Nick King is 6'7". Austin's long. He's 6'9 and long. Shaq is 6'8". Calvin Godfrey's 6'7", but long. We've got long – like, Markel's a big guard. And Keeper's you hope that length guard. disrupts teams. We, right? we, we have to utilize our length. And I know a lot of people in town have always talked about us playing zone and, and are you going to play more zone. And, you know, obviously our basis is going to have to be man, but we are going to be uh, uh, playing some zone. And, and we can be a very good zone team because of our length. The key to be a good zone team is you have to utilize your length. You can't have your hands down. You've got to have your hands out and high and really extend that court by using your length to your advantage. Because even a guy like Pookie Powell – He's 6'1", but his arm length is long. And I, we need to put that to our advantage uh, as much as we can. You've stressed physicality in the offseason. You want to be more physical. You don't want to get pushed around. You bring in a guy like Chris Hawkins, who's pretty tough. Yep. Chris Hawkins was really good in, uh, in Canada. I mean, he's, he's a hard-nosed guy. The biggest thing with Chris, you know, knock on wood, he's, his whole thing is about staying healthy. Right. And uh, he's had to lose weight. We've got his weight down. We're, we're, we're continued to, to uh, uh, make sure that he keeps his weight down. The biggest thing is, is him is taking care of his body. And I think the less, the, the, the less body fat he has, the more he's stretching with our strength coach, the better. But he's a guy that plays with a great motor. He's an undersized guy. He's one of those guys, Greg, that was not highly recruited. Right. But then when you – People, he where'd, you, where'd you find him? Mm -hmm. and, and he's a guy that's going to be a big piece for us. All right, quick thoughts, yep. a number of things we want to get in before we got to let you go. Nick King, will he basically be a three this year? Nick King will play. He will play at the three. He will also play at the four. Uh, but Nick King has to be able to guard on the perimeter. But him and Karan can be interchangeable in a lot of different areas. But Nick King, you will see Nick King on the perimeter. Yes, well, you will. That leads into that question. So Karan's interchangeable. But, but they where both is are. But where is his best position? I, I, I think, it seems like Iverson's better with the but, ball. But, but, and, but I think Nick and Karan are both – both. I, I call it the Karan box. Like we have a box for Karan where <laughs> right, he's right. not to stretch out on the floor mm -hmm. too far. I think both guys are very good around the rim, and that's where they're, 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 they're active. Nick's got such a great nose for being around the ball. So um, uh, they're both different, but they both can create matchup problems for the other team because they, kinda, they can feed off of each other and they're versatile enough to, to play either spot. You mentioned with the new additions – you could be a preseason top 25. If but, we get those guys qualified, yeah. But, but possibly not. In years past, you have been. And you like it. You said, I love being ranked, Greg. Well, if you're not, how, do you use that to your advantage? Well, I think what we're doing, uh, I, and I do believe this, I, I would prefer to be ranked. I, I right. mean, anyone that says you don't want to, you're wrong. I want to, I want to be preseason ranked number one. So mm -hmm. um, I do think if everyone's eligible, we get everyone through with the waivers, I do believe we're right there at a top 25 team. If not, then we're probably not going to be ranked on that. And that's fine. I mean, we're going to have to work, earn our way to back in there. And, and get, again, in the end, you just earn it on the court. But um, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing is it's not about using it for motivation. I think what we're doing right now is I've been a big believer in discipline, but mm -hmm. disciplining the individual. This offseason, I've done everything disciplining, holding the team accountable. When one person screwed up, the whole team is paying the price. And, 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 and I think that's been a big change for us and has really helped us, and I think that's going to make us better going into the season. How has Keelan Lawson fit in in your coaching staff? Keelan has done an excellent job. Uh, you know, I've got two veteran, veteran guys in, in, in Robert Kirby and Aki Collins, both future head coaches, guys who've been around, and, and they do an amazing job for me. Keelan comes in, who's been a head coach, a very successful high school coach. And the bottom line is, Greg, he's been better than I thought he's been. I mean, he's been good. He knows the game. He's been good with our guys. He's worked hard. Uh, he's been a sponge. He wants to learn. And so I've been very, very happy and pleased with Keelan. I know you're very excited about the schedule this year. Yeah, we are. And um, we have a tough schedule, and it's not easy. And I know some of the fans locally are want us to have every home game with big names sure. and this and that. But the teams that we have are good are good, good RPI games. And that's very important with it's your very schedule. Important. And yeah. people have to understand, that I've got to hit 18 home games. Mm -hmm. for, for the budget, we have to hit 18 home games. Once football starts really getting it going, and they're gonna, it's going to happen, they're going to get it going, and we're packing that place, maybe we don't have to have as many home games and we can do more homes and home. But I can't always do just home and home and get everyone, because if, if it's a name that everyone's so aware of, 
they're going to ask us to return it the following year, which puts you off balance. You have to have 18 home games. I'm required to do that right. due to the budget situation. So people have to understand, I, sometimes I just can't go get this name, that name, this name, that name, because I have to get teams that are not going to require us to return the game the following year. But I do know, and Tom Bowen said it last week on our show, that they're working on a couple of top 25 we, opponents for the we, future. We are, and, and, and getting out of some of the tournaments, the so-called three or four game tournaments where mm -hmm. you're Orlando or like Vegas, Vegas this, year. this year, moving yeah. those out and doing an exempted event where you just do a neutral site game and then play three home games. Then you have more flexibility to do more home and homes. And, and that's what we're trying to do. I, w I would like to be able to get to the point where every year we're having two, two or, or maybe three marquee uh, uh, home name teams coming on the non-conference. But let's not forget, this isn't CUSA. This is the American. We still got SMU coming, Connecticut coming, Cincinnati, Cincinnati right. Temple. We got some great home teams coming here that is not like it was back a few years ago. Hey, Josh, we're uh, so happy you took the time out to be with us. I know it's a busy time yep. recruiting-wise. You're back on the road and, and doing the things you need to do. Thank you so much. Thanks, Greg. I appreciate it's you. Always you do a such pleasure. a great job with this. I do. Tigers head coach Josh Pastner will take a break. Overtime is next. It's awfully hard to turn on your television in the summer and not run into the hit program American Ninja Warrior. These men and women are special. They're athletic, talented, and entertaining. And one of these special performers resides right here in the Memphis area, and his athletic abilities on a trampoline are likely familiar to Memphis Grizzlies fans. Brent Ruffin is a member of the high-flying Kings of the Court dunk troupe who perform at Grizzlies games. But Brent is also an American Ninja Warrior who goes by the alias Redneck Ninja. Recently, I met up with Brent at his CrossKick gym in Atoka. All right, Brent, I know everybody wants to know, Redneck Ninja, where did that nickname come from? Um, before I left for St. Louis this year, I had a couple of, uh, I had a couple of friends who were just like, man, you know, the hunter, the, you know, the duck hunter guy, they're like, you're the Redneck Ninja. And I was like, sure. And, uh, and it didn't really stick in my mind, but whenever I got to St. Louis, the producers were, uh, uh, they were like, do you have any kind of nickname or anything? And I was like, ah, the, one, the only one that stuck out was like, the Redneck Ninja, maybe? And they were all over it. <laughs> You're here at your gym, so obviously you can work out and stay in shape with things in this gym. But this is not like the obstacle course that you went through. So how do you practice for something like American Ninja Warriors? Uh, you know, like I said in several of my interviews uh, with American Ninja Warrior, um, I like to use my natural surroundings. I like to use trees and just really work on my grip strength. You know, I'll go out there and do, you know, like five minute holds on tree limbs and stuff like that. And I'll gradually increase the size of the tree limb and just really try to improve my grip strength. And, uh, but I have been traveling to several courses um, this year and guys who build these obstacles and train. And that's really what's helped me out a lot this season. How did you get hooked on this? Why did you want to do it? Uh, you know, um, I started kind of watching the show when I was 15, 16 years old. It was when it was in Japan, uh, Sasuke. And, um, you know, I thought to myself I could potentially do that kind of stuff. And then some time went on. And then I saw that they brought the show over to America. And I remember sitting over at my girlfriend's house one day. And, um, and her dad was like, you know, you should really try this. You should try to get into this. I think you could do it. So I kind of did some researching. And I got together with a buddy of mine who was a production guy. And we sent a video in. And they gave me a call. Yeah, you sent the video in for season five. Mm -hmm. And you went down to try to qualify in Miami. It didn't work out for you. You come back, you have to do a whole new video for this past season, and you make it. Now you go to St. Louis. Tell us the story, first of all, about the weather in St. Louis. Oh, it was ridiculous. Uh, the, weather, the, the weather there was crazy. We, um, we got there, it was like 71 degrees a day. We were doing our TV interviews and all the paperwork and that kind of stuff, and we were all just, you know, we were enjoying the weather. It was extremely nice outside. Uh, one of the guys, Joe, the weatherman down there, one of the competitors was like, hey, we got a big storm system coming in. It could potentially change the weather. Uh, that night we were going over the rules and everything. The big storm came through. We woke up the next morning and it was snow flurrying outside. Still had to go on with the show. Oh yeah, absolutely. 29 degrees or not. You make that first qualifying run, you succeed, you get up there on the top, you hit that red button there, whatever it is. How good of a feeling was it? Oh, it's crazy. When I, when I made it up the wall, man, I thought I was about to break that button off, man. It was, it was, a, it was a great feeling. I had been envisioning that, that moment, you know, ever since I applied for season six. So it was, it was fantastic to get up there and just smash it. What was the hardest part of the qualifying run? 
Uh, the hardest part of the qualifying run was the, uh, was the obstacle right before the wall. It's usually a pretty grueling upper body uh, obstacle. Uh, they call the tilting ladders. And, uh, and basically, I mean, it's like an upside down seesaw. The ladders go up and down, so you had to climb up backwards, tilt one ladder down, climb back down it, and then reach over. It was a pretty long lache. You had to reach over, grab that one, and do, essentially do the same thing. And with it being 29 degrees, it was just extra grueling on the, on the upper body. You reach the semifinals, there's only 30 participating, and you don't complete the course. What happened there? Um, you know, uh, I don't know. I'm not really sure what it was. Uh, I just didn't, I didn't feel the same whenever I got on the stage that night. I felt a little under the weather, but I was like, you know, the show's got to go on. So I gave it my best, made it through the qualifiers again, and got to the next one that started the semi uh, the semi qualifier, and then it was the salmon ladder. I made it up three rungs, was going up for the last one, and um, and got my left arm up, but the right arm just quite didn't make it. So I tried to fix it, tried to fix it. The third time I tried to go, you know, get it up over the last rung, there I went into the water. What's the hardest part about being an American Ninja Warrior, and what would be your advice to somebody who's out there watching you and wondering if they can do that? Um. I would say the hardest part is just it, just being committed to your training. I mean, it's grueling stuff that we have to go through. Uh, the upper body and the fingertip and just the grip training that you have to do is just, I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, I, I'll tell you this much. I'm more sore from Ninja Warrior training than I ever have been from lifting weights or training for wrestling or mixed martial arts or any of that. Um, so really just staying committed. And for somebody who's trying to get into the show and wanting to go out there and try to do this stuff, uh, start training now, uh, get in the best shape of your life, you know, best shape of your life, lose some weight, do that kind of stuff because uh, you're gonna be carrying your body weight throughout the whole thing. Well, you're a fit guy, obviously you have this facility, but you're already training hard for next season. You plan to return again. Oh, absolutely. I'm already training for season seven. So now do you become this local celebrity to people? I know the beard has been trimmed, but do they, they, they know who you are? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, they, absolutely. Uh, I just went into a, you know, a haircutting place today to get my haircut, and they were like, hey, I know, you're, the, uh, you're the redneck ninja guy. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. So. Not only are you the redneck ninja, but also people may know you from Grizzlies games, part of the king of the court, mm -hmm. kings of the court. And so you're one of those guys up there jumping off the trampoline with Grizz, Duncan basketballs. Tell me a little bit about that. How'd you get involved? Um, I was training mixed martial arts at the time at a GM out in Memphis at the time. Little did I know that the Grizz mascot was training there. Uh, you know, he was just up there trying to stay in shape, get some boxing under his belt. And he said he'd been watching me for a couple of weeks and we got to talking one day, still didn't know who he was. And he was like, hey, you know, I'm the Grizzlies mascot. He was like, uh, I'd like for you to come out and try out for my dunk team. And, you know, and I had been to a couple of Grizzlies games at the time, and I, and, uh, and I asked him, I said, what, a dunk team? And he's like, you know, the, the Elvis guy, the John Tramplines. I was like, no way. And uh, he said, yeah, come out Monday. I was like, okay. So I met him up at the gym that they were training at. I tried out and made it, and the rest is history. You're going into your fourth season, is that correct? Yep, fourth season. What's the, uh, the most fun about doing that? Uh... I would say just, you know, just the, the crowds. I mean, you're getting to jump off a trampoline and dunk a basketball, you know <laughs> what I mean? And uh, I've never been able to dunk a basketball. And just to be able to, you know, get up there and learn these stunts and these tricks and just, you know, I love performing and performing in front of crowds and getting to do that kind of stuff. I mean, it's been awesome. You played a bunch of sports at Munford High, but you didn't play basketball. No, not basketball. All right, so now the game plan is just to work out, to continue to push yourself. How do you get to that next level, make it through the semifinals, maybe get to the finals, become a much bigger celebrity, maybe win the darn thing? What, what do you need to do to take that next step? Uh, you know, just keep training harder, just gradually take my training up to the next level. You know, I stepped it up this year and, uh, and made it further than I did last year. The plan is just to keep stepping it up. I'm going to try to actually trim a little more weight. Uh, I'm one of the bigger ninjas out there, so I'm, you know, I'm planning on you know, trying to trim about 10 more pounds, and uh, that way I can move my body weight around a little better. All right, last thing for you. You and I were talking before we started taping this interview about what goes on at the taping of American Ninja Warrior. What can you tell the folks? What would surprise the people about what happens when you go up to wherever the destination may be, in your case, St. Louis? Uh, probably the most, probably the most interesting, uh, the most interesting thing about it is just how back to back to back everything is. I mean, you're, it, when, as soon as you show up to the qualifying course, you're shooting interviews, you're doing paperwork, you're going over the rules, going over the obstacles. You've never seen the obstacles before. You've never seen the course that they set up. And, uh, I mean, like I said, just back to back to back to back. I mean, you know, when you're there, you better be ready to go. He is the Redneck Ninja. Brent, thank you so much. Best of luck to you. Yeah, I appreciate you. Great stuff from the Redneck Ninja. On the gridiron, the Memphis Tigers did something last Saturday that is awfully rare. They won over fans while losing a football game. But it's the way they lost that had local football fans buzzing. 
The 23 point underdog Tigers made a trip to Pasadena, California, where they battled 11th ranked UCLA. The Tigers lost in a shootout 42 35, but won the admiration of a city. Redshirt sophomore quarterback Paxton Lynch threw for 305 yards and a touchdown on 27 of 41 passing. He added a score on the ground. Brandon Hayes, Dorlin Dorsius, and Sam Kraft added touchdowns. And defensive back Fritz Etienne added a fourth quarter pick six that tied the game at 35. The Tigers offense finished the game with 469 yards of total offense. Memphis will have this weekend off and will return to action a week from Saturday at home versus Middle Tennessee State. And finally, the Memphis Redbird season came to an abrupt end last Saturday as they fell to Omaha three games to one in the PCL Northern Championship Series. Omaha advanced to their fourth straight PCL championship. And that'll put a wrap on the show. Next week, we air on a special day, Friday the 19th at 7.30. So go ahead and mark it down. Until then, have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Production funding for Sports Files is made possible in part by... Infinity of Memphis has moved to Germantown Road just half mile north of Wolf Chase Galleria and is proud to support WKNO for its quality broadcasting and service to our community. Quality and service? No wonder Infinity of Memphis feels at home on WKNO. The Lighting Source, major line distributor of commercial and industrial lighting, including hard-to-find bulbs and fixtures, as well as a broad range of LED products. With 35 years' experience servicing lighting needs, The Lighting Source proudly sponsors Sports Files.